that's the remix. Um, Kat says, you love this one. Thank you so much. I did have the metronome on for some reason. I think I was doing an audio sync test before and I left the metronome on by accident. But yeah, hey, it was kind of hot. Maybe I should keep it in. Maybe I should do a re-release, like a metronome edit, like with the metronome through the whole thing. Boom, boom, boom. It's pretty, pretty sick. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, story, I, I don't have subs yet because I'm not affiliate yet. I'm working towards that. <laughs> Need to do more streams first. But yeah, as soon as I'm allowed to have subs, we'll sort that out. Um, the Wave Racer Twinkles. Yeah, I'm going to cover how I... I mean, in the last stream I did, the Bubble Wrap stream, if any of you watched that, I kind of covered how I did a little bit of that sound design. I can kind of touch on that again today. Um, well, now, of course, because I turned the bot off, now I'm getting spam. But look, we can deal with a bit of spam. That's fine. I'll, I'll treat it as a compliment. Uh, I'm, I'm flattered to be getting spam messages. Uh, <laughs> um... Brooks Ivory says a lot of sounds to mix. Yeah, there are quite a few. This is actually a relatively easygoing mix um, because a lot of the sounds are quite smooth already and quite chill. So this wasn't too difficult. I think I had a bit of trouble mixing the drums in this one, um, which I'll go over. But yes, I did mix this myself. This is back in the day when I was uh, too nervous to get other people to touch my song. So I did absolutely everything myself, including mixing and mastering. Um, a true banger says the audio. Oh, thank you. Yes, Alex Hay in the uh, in the tracks here. You can see Alex Hay. Um, yes, that is because it's um, a friend of mine called Alex saying hey. So I labeled it as such. Um, I'll go over all the different vocal chants and everything that's in the song as we as we progress. A Crivian says you're super impressed with the amount of percussion going on. Yeah, there's quite a bit. Um, Again, not quite as much as I had in the last stream, which was bubble wrap, but there's a, yeah, there are actually, yeah, there are a fair amount of percussion layers going on here. Um, and I'll play all those in a moment. Cameron says, Wave versus micro edits with the perk is always amazing. Thank you so much. And what is the last chord at the end of the chorus? It kind of leads into the next part of the song, and I like that a lot. Yeah, that's a, I think I know what you're talking about. It's a, um, it's a, it's a special, like, major seven chord in the space where you would expect a minor chord to normal, normally be or something. So it, Kind of feels a bit um, juicy, a bit saucy, um, but I'll cover the I will cover the chord composition. Um, I'll cover all of that. Um, <laughs> Tokyo Megaplex, yes, welcome to the stream. Thank you for being here. Um, all right, let's get into it. Cameron says your favorite thing is the ARPs. Yeah, I covered again. If you can go and watch my VOD for the Bubble Wrap stream, which I did a couple of weeks ago, I covered pretty much in detail how I made these kinds of ARPs. Um, I will cover it a little bit again today, but to save myself repeating myself too much, I will refer you to that, but I will still cover it as, as we go. So that was the song. Um, the drums, I guess, obviously I will start by saying this remix was particularly easy for me to make because of the fact that the song was already so good. Um, we have... Like when it's like when you're making a remix, obviously you have source material to begin with, so it's a very different process to writing your own song from scratch. A very different process, and it's often a lot easier because you already have a base of material that you can draw from, that you get instant instant inspiration from. Um, and in this case, obviously the vocals in this song are fantastic. We've got world class vocalists. We've got Chance the Rapper and Tanache, um, two of the best probably artists in the world at the time. Um, Chance is still up there with, you know, great, world's greatest artists, world's greatest voices. So, uh, yeah, I mean, having that kind of source material at my disposal for a remix like this was obviously a pleasure. And, um, and it made my life easier to be able to work with such good sounding, good quality stems, good quality music. And from there, it was just about deciding what kind of vibe I wanted to take it in, what kind of um, sounds I wanted to use, like what kind of groove I wanted it to be. Obviously, the original song is quite, it's got quite an emotional feel to it. It's kind of a sad song in a way. I mean, it's a pop song, but it's kind of sad. Um, so I wanted to counteract that by injecting a little bit of, um, a little bit of, I don't know, joyful, serendipitous, fun element <laughs> i don't know um i didn't want to repeat the the original vibe the whole point of a remix i think is to re sort of reshape 
the vibe of a song in a way and um, inject my own personality into it. So that's what I did. Tokyo Megaplex, glad to finally catch one of these live. I'm glad you're here, man. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, yeah, well, luckily I do keep these up after for anyone who does happen to miss them. It is always, obviously, it's nice to be here live because you can send your questions in and I can answer them in real time. But if you can't stick around live, if you can't be here for the whole thing, you can always watch it back later. Um, it'll be up. So, obviously, let's, let's just isolate the vocal for a bit and just appreciate how good it is. We open with the vultures kissing the cannibals. Should I get lonely when I'm the only, only human in the heaving heat of the animals? And you can see all I've done here, I honestly have barely touched Tanashi's vocal at all. I've got a tiny bit of EQ, just like doing some slight different, like slight shaping to fit in with my sound design and then a tiny bit of compression. And that's it. Like it already was perfectly, it already was mixed and produced beautifully. So I didn't have to do anything to it. Um, it's what I did underneath the vocals that's more interesting. I mean, I did, I did do some cool layering. If you listen to this part. All my friends are wasted. So this is Tanashi's vocal with this plugin Bitspeak, which I also mentioned in the last stream. Bitspeak kind of is like a it it synth, it resynthesizes audio. So if you send a vocal to it, you can kind of tell it's like adding this kind of. That's without it. That's with it. So I'm kind of adding this like synthesized grittiness on top of, and it's mixed in dry wet. You can see it's like 36 percent mixed in. So it's a little subtle sort of crispy, digitally bit crushy, crunchy thing on top. And I'm doing that deliberately to to differentiate from her like clean lead verse. We vocal. Open with the vultures. And then of course behind that we've got her back. All my friends are wasted. And I hate this club. Man, I drink too. So this is actually her pitched up by 12. So it's the stem, the Tanashi backing vocal stem. She originally sang it low, like in the low octave, and I just pitched it up because I wanted to match her high octave, but it added this cool texture to have it artificially pitched up. Hey, Saya Music, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Um, Acrivian one, I have to head out for a work meeting. Thanks for doing this. I'll check out the VOD later. Peace. Good stuff. Acrivian, thank you for joining briefly. And yeah, absolutely. Come back and watch the VOD later and, um, have a good day at work. I hope your meeting's not too stressful. <laughs> so yeah, we've got those, obviously a little bit of manipulation to the audio files themselves. Just here with a bit of synthesized bit speak on top and here a little bit of repitching. Um, using the complex pro mode in Ableton, which lets you pitch up without re-adjusting the speed, and it lets you adjust the formants as well. All my friends are wasted, and I hate so I deliberately didn't make it chipmunky like that. All my friends are wasted. I kind of tried to keep the original formants, so it sounded like she was just singing it higher, but of course it has this digitally, artificially pitched um, feeling to it, which is kind of nice. And when you're layering it underneath another layer, it adds a kind of cool texture. Uh, what does it sound like with full wet bit speak? Let's have a listen. It's a good question. All my friends are wasted And I hate this club And I drink too much That's what it sounds like. It's pretty cool. I love this plugin. It has this really cool quality. Um, and, you, like, it's... I've got this detune setting too, so it's kind of creating like a chorusy, unisony effect as well. Um, and you can even repitch it up and down semitones and all this. It's got a bit of noise and like, yeah, it's it's cool. It's um, all my friends are wasted. yeah, it's very like robotic. Um, I now instead of bit speak, I tend to use uh, vocal synth by Isotope now. But this is kind of like a more simplistic version of that, but it also has its own character, which you can't really necessarily get from vocal synths. But yeah, cool stuff. Moving on, we've got the chance vocal and I'll cover what I did to the chance verse, um, like behind, not to his actual recording of his vocal, but behind in the drums, I did some cool stuff. I hate the bar. 
Pharmacy addict hit a Wall Street traffic took the car. We reinvent the wheel just to fall asleep at it. So he's got this certain rhythm and flow um, to how he performs his vocals. And I kind of wanted to match that with the percussion in the background, um, which I'll cover in a moment. I just got to get to the chat. Cameron says, with Ableton's Warp and Complex Pro, what is the envelope? I always mess around with it. I have no idea. It, I almost never touch the envelope. Um, the envelope is some very technical thing that I don't really... It, it's kind of just like a... It's if you're using really, really, really complex audio, I think. Um, it doesn't... It almost never makes any difference to what I'm doing. Formance, on the other hand, is very useful. Basically, formance is the difference between having it sound like it's... So formance refers to, like, throat length. So, like, you could change the the width of your vocal cords to be like lower sounding or higher sounding, kind of like what I was just doing then. So when you, in the formance setting in Ableton, it lets you, it lets you retain the formance. If you have it at a hundred, that means it's keeping the formance where they were. But if you have it at zero, it means it's fully shifting the formance to whatever you've pitched it to. So because it's pitched up 12 here, when I had it at zero, it sounded really chip monkey because if you did genuinely pitch up a piece of audio 12 semitones in the analog world, you would get this chip monkey effect um, where the formants are like super shifted high as you shift the pitch high. But keeping the formants amount higher towards 100 lets you retain the formant energy of the original pitch without... So that kind of saves you from getting that cartoonish chip monkey effect. Um, can be very useful. And it, the fact that it's on a sliding scale from 0 to 100 lets you kind of... A, just to taste where you want it to sit. Envelope, don't ask me. <laughs> um, so the complex performance adds more vocals to the sound. No, that's not what happened. Hopefully, hopefully I made that clear. Yeah, the chance vocal IRL girl is in the chat. Everyone say hi. Puppy Mountain is also in the chat. Oh my God, more voice stuff. <laughs> Someone clip that. You clip it, puppy. You clip it, Puppy Mountain. Um... Tokyo Megaplex wants to be able to automate the formants and warping stuff so bad. Yeah, I don't know why it's not automatable. I think it's probably something to do with CPU or something, but it's not easy to... You can you can record it live, but you can't automate it at the moment. Um, is Get Your Snack on one of your SoundCloud accounts? I No, I only have one SoundCloud account, and it's Wave Racer. Um, <laughs> IRL girl and Puppy Mountain are two of my IRL friends in real life. So um, it's cool to... So everybody make them welcome, you know? These are my friends. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the chance verse. Let's, I'll show you what I did with the chance, the rapper verse, with the percussion in the background. I hate the bar. Now listen to the Pharmacy percussion. Hit a Wall Street traffic took the car. We reinvent the wheel just to fall asleep at it. Crash on the floor, catch the ZZZ. Popping the polar opposite the NZT. Hip hop in the propaganda, say they name brand. But I just seen how the did my main man. The nights we won't remember are the nights we won't remember. I'll be gone till November on my city call for Simba. Dreams I made for cages, nigga lions. I'm for real, nigga dying. It's for real, nigga dying. Feel nigga Fridays up for chill. And not escape the treachery. I just had to rest in peace, the recipe. The rest of us is brand. Did you guys hear that? Um. Sorry, yeah. Did you guys hear the uh, the rim shot in the background? So let me play that. Crash on the floor, catch the ZZZ. Popping the polar opposite the NZT. Hip hop in the prop. That's here. Nights we won't remember. Are the nights we won't remember. So I added this rim shot in the drum layer to cover, to literally like replicate the rhythm of the syllables of Chance the Rapper's vocal. So, um, like you can hear it goes dip -a -dip -a -dip, like that swung out. Nice to won't remember, dip -a -dip, you know, that bit. Nights we won't remember are the nights we won't remember. And listen to the... So I kind of, I wanted to emphasize that rhythm because I felt like it was really, that swung out bit was, was kind of falling flat without that reinforcement with the percussion. So I added, like, because the rest of it is not swung out as much. It's like... It's more free. So yeah, the rim shot in the background, it's subtle, but it's really reinforcing every syllable on the swung out rhythm, um, which I thought was like one of the coolest parts of this remix. I know it's like probably a subtle thing. Um, 
I don't know really what you guys are talking about with the uh, get your snack on stuff. Um, if someone could fill me in there, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I did there. Obviously, Chance the Rapper's vocal here is insane. Like, it's so cool. And it's Um, the, I guess that's a good way to, oh wait, I did actually want to cover, while I'm doing the vocal stuff, I covered the bit speak, we covered Chance and Tinashe, we've got these, like, effects. So that's actually something from the stems, like, the Snake Hips guys did this. It's obviously, like, an outtake, probably from Tinashe or one of the other vocalists, and, like, it's like pitched up and like warped and added reverb and echo and stuff. And it was this really cool melodic embellishment. Um, and I loved that. And I just, I littered that throughout the song because I felt like it was really falling nicely over the chords that I had. Um, because it's got that melody, um, which kind of follows the major scale. And I think I even pitched it up and down a little bit. Yeah. It was really cool. So I used that as like a, a sample from the stems throughout the whole song, um, which I think is really cool. There's a bunch of other little vocal stems here, like the gang. So that's like reinforcing the, the hook. And then there's um, some chopped up little bits. I think that's basically just some of the like ad libs or backing vocals from the chants, r the rapper stem. Um, but it, I got like a part where it sounded like he was singing a note. I made a rhythm out of that to kind of complement. And also, yeah, the way that that sat over the chords. Where are the chords? Oh, here they are. Because, yeah, obviously he's singing the, the root note of the song and I had the chords re-harmonizing underneath. So that was cool to be able to use a bit of the stem um, as a harmon as like a harmony to the main part of the song. Do you We've got the Tanashi bridge here. Do you get lonely? So I get lonely, lonely. Really nice harmonies there. Obviously, again, like beautiful vocal performances. And I did like a cool progression under here. I'll cover the chords in a bit, but. Gospel. Love that part. I love the chords I did there too. Um, let me just keep up with the chat. Puppy Mountain says it reminds you of the Can Blaster. Yeah, I love Can Blaster. And I think you're right. Yeah, that rhythmic emphasis. He does it with the kick drums. Yeah, like you said. Uh, he, yeah, he loves making kick patterns based on the vocal flow. Yeah. Oh, and Get Your Snack On created my sounds at the link you posted above. Okay. Um, let's have a listen then. Well, I'm opening it on my other computer, but... Let's see. Oh, I remember this. Oh, I remember this. Yeah, he really accurately recreated what I was doing. <laughs> That's cool. Um, good on him. Uh, uh, what do we got? Yeah, Cam Blaster's the, the goat. Such a good, such a good artist. Yeah, I hope you guys are clipping all my lovely vocal performances. Um, you barely, oh, Balb says, you barely use sample pack except for effects. That's awesome how you do that. I honestly try not to use sample packs as much. Like, I, nowadays, I barely ever use samples from sample packs. I just found it really um, restricting to try and find the right sample. And I felt like I was always compromising. So I just like to make my own ones now. And I think at this point when I was making, this was a few years ago, but when I was making this, I already started to think in that way. Godson's 4330 says, hi from Japan. 
Love to see people tuning in from Japan. I want to go back to Japan. Thank you for tuning in. Didn't those chops pitch up? Um, yeah, they might be pitched. I might have pitched it to make them fit in the key of the song. Um, Jorgen Odegaard. Legendary remix. Thank you so much. Um, such great chords. Casey Accidental. Thank you so much. Sus4. Probably. Chef's Kiss. Mwah. I'm going to add a GIF in the YouTube edit. Mwah. I actually did. <laughs> if you watch my uh, if you watch my most recent uh, edit of the bubble wrap stream that I put on YouTube, um, it's got the it's got a chef's gift gif. Ah, very nice. Um, I'm very proud of that edit, by the way. I think it's really funny. You should all watch it. Get me some YouTube views so I can start monetizing. Oh, um, would be amazing if you do a sample pack for Splice. Well, I got good news. It's happening. But that's all I'm going to say. I've said too much. Puffy Mountain's got to go, but Illy and thank you, Wavy. Thank you, Puffy Mountain, for tuning in. Um, I'll see you next time. Phantom Shoto, you just searched me and you found me on Twitch. Here I am. Thank you for tuning in. Divorce Papers, hey, man, good to have you back. Thanks for tuning in. Um, see you later, Puppy Mountain. The string suspense chords on the chance verse right before the drop. How did you get that crisp vinyl tape break? The string sus let me see the string suspense chord on the chance verse right before the drop. Oh yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, let's see what we got. That's a cool little like that only happens once that little chord movement there. So we got. Um, so we got a few different layers going on. We've got like an organ. We've got a piano. And you can hear at the end there, I've, I've re I like pitched down the, the end of the piano chord there. Because I bounced it to audio and then you can do that kind of cool like pitch down effect in Ableton. I did that and I also did the exact same thing to these strings. Is that maybe what you're talking about? If not... Uh, you're hoping for some serum presets in the sample pack. Got good news for you, buddy. Got new good news for you. There's some serum presets. Only a few, but they're, and they're not probably what you're used to for serum presets. They're kind of unique. Um, but yeah, made them from scratch. Don't know when it's coming out. I think next year. Um, keep your eyes peeled. Um, oh, and start that wavy sub discord. Yeah, I actually do have a discord. If you guys type the discord command, like if you go exclamation point and then discord in the chat, it'll give you a link to the discord server. Um, you can join right away. Please do. I want to, um, there it is. Hopefully, oh no, cause I turned the bot off. Let me turn it back. On. <laughs> I'm going to turn it uh, back on. Sorry. Uh, checkmans. Hey, it normally works. It was working before. Um. Oh, sorry, guys. Unmute. Unmute. Thank you. Now try again. Um. Anyway. Um. So. Uh, Jacques asks, save this please. I am saving it. It'll be up on the Twitch and it'll be saved there as a VOD and a highlight, but it'll also be um, edited and put together on YouTube. Um, hey, we got the bot working again. Everyone welcome the bot back. Thank you, bot. Welcome back to the chat. Um, loving the highlights. Thank you so much. I really love making them. It's a lot of work, but um, it is quite fun. I'm really quite proud of the last one I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's really funny. Uh, but yeah, sorry, I'm getting very sidetracked today. I'm sorry about that. Um, and you guys got to keep me on track. Ask me questions about the music. Um, you guys are very distracting.
Okay, so I think I covered the, the vocals and we are finished there. We've got all the vocals covered. Um, yeah, they just like, like I said, I didn't do much apart from a bit of repitching to some of the vocals, a bit of chopping up and editing some of the little bits and pieces. At the end here, like the very last chorus, you can kind of hear Chance doing some backing vocals. And some more ad libs from Tanache as well. Like, it's just so good. Like, I didn't have to do anything because it already sounded so good. Like, in some remixes I do, I deliberately really mess the vocal up. Like, I really go crazy with processing and editing and morphing the vocal into something else entirely. But for this song, I didn't want to do that. And I deliberately left the vocals pretty much intact, apart from a few little bits and bobs, so that I could really just go to town with, like, reharmonizing, re-instrumenting, and, like, rearranging um, all the instrumentation beneath it. So that was kind of my focus here. So the, yeah, apart from some of those vocal chops and stuff like that. That's kind of the most interesting part of the vocal layers. Um, the drums and stuff, let's have a listen to just the drums in the last chorus here. Okay, um, do I write my own chords on guitar, on guitar or keyboard MIDI? I do it all usually with keyboard slash MIDI in the computer, but nowadays I am playing guitar more, so it's kind of both. Um, Carlson says, you're trying to use Twitch cheer bits but can't get them working, how can we throw away this coin? Okay, yes, I'm not a Twitch affiliate yet, and I don't think bits work. Um, I don't think bits work unless you're an affiliate or like a partner. So once I get that, I'm hoping to get that all integrated into the channel. IRL Gal has very kindly just uh, linked my tip page that you can tip there if you'd like to. Um, if you do, your message will come up on screen and I will shout you out. So thank you very much for that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the only way if you choose to support the channel um, now, you can do so at the link. Um, there's a link on my actual uh, like Twitch profile to the donate link there um, as well as all my other social media pages and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, until I become a very fancy Twitch affiliate or partner, unfortunately, bits and subs are yet to be integrated. But thank you so much for asking and thank you for attempting at least to do so. I really, really appreciate that. Um, let's keep going. So we got the drums. Very clean sounding drums in this one. Um, I kind of just, so I've actually got mainly just this one drum rack here where it says drums three. That probably just means, drums three probably just means I attempted two times before to make it good and then I settled on the third revision. Very simple drums. So for the kick, it's all actually, in, in a rack, interestingly, some usually I separate my drums into individual channels, um, but in this case, I just made a drum rack. The kick, some snare, clap, another clap, hi hat, and that rim shot, and that's like the main drum rack. Harrison's just tipped five dollars, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone, give a huge and loving embrace to Karistens for the five dollars that she just donated to me. That is so very kind of you. Um, I really, really appreciate that. Now, I'm hoping your name will appear on the screen. Uh, we'll see how that goes. It might need a second to update, but thank you so much for that. Um, View source says, pretty sure I posted that kick plugin in the awesome group ages ago. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, the awesome group. Damn, we taking it way back. Okay. Are you Aussie? Because I think, oh no, Aussie group, uh, awesome group was not just Aussie, was it? Um, <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, bassism, bassism. 
that was before I got kick two, which is what I use now for kicks. This was kind of like the rudimentary kick drum generation plug in. Um, Five dollar walla. Yes, thank you so much. I feel so blessed. Um, uh, I will talk more about the chords and the synths. Um, I think after I cover these drums, I'll cover like the melodic elements and the bass elements and all that stuff. So just hang tight. Uh, but yeah, here we got the drums. So bassism is doing the kick. Um, if you watch my last stream, it's exactly how I made the kick in bubble wrap as well. It just lets you like pick where you want to sweep from. Like it lets you create like a sine wave generated kick envelope sweep thingy. Um, and then I've just EQ'd that, compressed it a little bit, saturated a little bit, bit more EQ. Um, so obviously in drum racks, if you use Ableton, you're probably familiar with drum racks and it lets you have each drum sample or each drum sound on its own like sort of cell or channel. And then you can apply processing to each one of those sounds individually. So it doesn't affect any of the other ones. And so that's what I've done here. Um, I've got a snare from some sample pack uh, uh, with a bit of EQ on it because sample pack stuff tends to already be so heavily processed. Um, you can see that's like heavily compressed, um, very saturated, very maximized. I tend not to overly process existing samples from sample packs because um, they already have that baked in. With my own stuff that I'm creating from scratch, on the other hand, like this bassism kick, which I made it from scratch, I do need to do a bit more processing to get it to sort of sit alongside the other more processed samples. Very, it's something to be aware of. A lot of people don't think about this. Like, stuff in sample packs is already so processed, generally. Um, so you have to really take that into consideration. Um, did we ever drop out then? I hope not. Um, do you prefer to make your own kicks? I certainly do. Uh, Whimsical Astro, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I do make my own kicks almost always um, because... It just is so much easier than finding the perfect kick. I can just make the perfect kick. Um, you know, like, and I find the sound design process more fulfilling and more fun anyway. So, yeah, once I learned how kick or how drum synthesis in general works, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And I think around this time, I was just starting to really discover, like, how to do that stuff. And so that's what we got here with, like, plugins like Bassism and... Um, Kick 2 is, is the more modern, more flexible version that I use now. Oh, sorry about that. So, yeah. Um, in this drum rack too, you can see I've actually got three different reverb sends. You can do that in the rack itself. So you can, I've got one for claps. Well, I got clap verb, kick verb, and snare verb. And those are all getting sent. You can see here, send A, send B, send C. And that means I'm sending different sounds within this drum rack to the different reverb sends. Um, I love that about drum racks. You can actually create effect sends just dedicated for the drum rack, which is so cool. So yeah, you can see I've got my clap layers and my stuff getting sent to the clap verb, and I've got the kick being sent to a kick verb, which is probably like monoed, and yeah, it's like they all have different settings on them, which means all these different sounds can have their own little roomy texture to them. Uh, and then of course they're all mixed and panned, you can see here. Drum racks are really, really useful in that way. Um, a huge amount of flexibility. It's like its own mixing console just for drums, which is really cool. Um, uh, and then, of course, on this whole drum group, I've got a bit of processing. So all this stuff is affecting the whole group right here. So we've got overdrive, compression, saturation, a little bit of EQ, a bit more saturation. And both the saturators are on different modes. Like this is analog clip mode and this is digital clip mode. So this one at the end here is really just trying to keep the peaks in check. It's more like an administrative <laughs> saturator rather than a character saturator. And this one is providing a little bit of actual um, analog saturations, which actually gives it a bit of character. Um, so yeah, different types of saturation at different points. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the drums. What else we got? We got another clap sample from Boy Wonder. That's that one. We got a Lex Luger thing. I use these ones all the time. Um, again, they're already quite processed. I just did a little bit of like affecting the tone and the stereo width of these ones, I think. Yeah, nothing crazy. And then I love the 606 hi-hat. So that's a short hi-hat from the Roland 606 drum machine. And this is just Ableton stock. Like Ableton comes with 
these sounds. Um, love this little cute hi hat. It's really cool. Nothing fancy going on there. Then an 808 rim shot again from the Ableton Core library. Um, pretty simple in terms of the main drum elements. But then, of course, there's more happening than just that. If I turn on the whole group. So this one at the top is those drums that I just covered, that main drum rack. And then we've got percussion elements, extra layers, extra stuff like cymbals, all this kind of stuff happening um, on top of that as embellishment. One of the big things is this tambourine loop. Obviously, it's pretty ubiquitous, that loop. Everyone loves that. <laughs> uh, and that just kind of just loops. It has a swing to it because the song is kind of swung out. So uh, do you hear a clock in there? You certainly do. Here it is. Tick tock. Really good like tick tock sample. And this was before the days of actual tick tock dancing teenagers app. <laughs> yeah, I love using clock samples as like percussive elements. It's kind of, you kind of like Ableton lets you warp all the TikToks to the grid, so it's kind of perfectly lined up with the beat. And um, yeah, it's a really cool way to get a rhythmic texture going on above your drums or whatever. I use that. There's loads. Of, I actually have like a whole folder full of just clock samples. Um, this one is a loop, but I also have like individual TikTok hits. Um, yeah. Really cool way to add texture to your drums. Um, hi, just wanted to stop by and say Finding Your Ryan Must Be Destroyed remix in 2015 changed my taste for life. Love you, baby. Oh, thank you so much. That is my favorite remix, probably. It's also the only remix I've had, or only material, in fact, I've had so far that's been printed on vinyl, which is really cool. Um, so thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Um, it is, it is, that one means a lot to me. Um, is that TikTok the same one from Standstill? I think it is, yes. I think it actually definitely is. It might be pitched differently here, but yep. I used it. <laughs> I used it multiple times. Um, <laughs> Divorce Papers can't believe this track predicted TikTok. Hey, you know what they say, I'm a, I'm a futuristic guy. <laughs> um, in that song were those Yoshi samples throughout the song? Uh, well, I, I don't want to risk incriminating myself. But let's just say perhaps. Moving on. We've got like snare fills. So all these little details add this extra element to the drums. And I haven't even touched on these tuned percussions yet, which are down here, which add a lot as well. We've got some snaps here. Just a snap sample. Very nice one, actually. Quite lush. Bit of reverb and stuff. That adds on, that sits on top of the claps and snares to give it a little bit of flavor. Oh, of course, one of my big tricks is to add a tambourine on top of the kick. So what I've done here, I've actually copied all the MIDI. You can see all this MIDI is identical on the drums layer and the tambourine layer. I copy the MIDI from the drum rack and I paste it onto the tambourine layer, but I only put a sound in the kick where the kick was in the drum rack. In this case, I've just got a tambourine from Latin Percussion, Ableton's Latin Percussion. And uh, I just have that hit at the same time the kick does, because the MIDI is identical. So if I play, you can hear the kicks and the tambourines are playing the exact same time. Come on, here we go. Let me just... So what that does is because the kick is quite low and thuddy, it doesn't have a lot of high end information because it is just really just a sine wave thud. Um, this tambourine is kind of making it feel like it's real, like it sits in a real space and it's actually adding vibration and texture around the room. Like that's a good little psychoacoustic trick that I liked. It also just has a nice percussive feel to it. What else we got? These triangles. I love Latin percussion. So 
triangles from Latin percussion, really clipped to make it sort of not, because they're quite peaky, so I clipped them. And they're, all, they're also repitched and tuned. Yeah, you can see they've all been transposed um, very carefully to match the key of the song. Ding! In this instance, I think to, they're tuned up to the perfect fifth. Yeah. Crash symbol from Lex Luger. Gotta love it. Crash symbol from Ableton. And those are all like processed and side chained to the kick drums, of course. Nothing fancy there. Another 808 crash symbol thing. This one I think is from like a uh, machine, like Native Instruments machine or battery or something like that. And it's 808X, which means the X just means I think it's been like processed with stereo modulation and stuff. So it sounds a bit more lush. It's a good one. Um, 909 crash. I love the 909 and like the 707 crash. They have like a very sort of, they have this texture that is just really nice. And um, you don't even have to really do much to them and they just sound good on top of other drums. This does have processing on it though. Like this is another one of those X ones. So it's got like stereo processing on it and it's um, been further processed by myself. Good stuff. Um, then we've got another clap layer here. I've called that ringy clap because I think you can hear that kind of ringy resonance in the back of it. And I have tuned, yep, I've tuned that so that that ringing resonance is again in tune with the key of the song. It's always nice to tune anything, any drum or percussion element in your song that has some sort of tonality to it. I always find it's quite helpful and quite important to tune that to the key of your song. You can either do it by repitching or by doing frequency shifting, whatever is appropriate for the sound. But yeah, here we've got another clap, AFP clap. It's from an African percussion pack. It's like a very textural, like roomy sounding clap. Um, my good old Perk 46, my signature from the DR660. Uh, in reverse though. And repitched again. Let me just power through these drums and then I'll go back to the chat. We've got Future Clap, what is that? Oh yeah, that's another thing that I use a lot. Sonic Specialists, UF, I don't know, it's a pack that someone gave me. I think it was from What's So Not or Hayden James or something gave them to me. Cool, like, really, really gritty, like, compressed clap sound. It, it works well as a layer on top of other stuff. So if I play like that with the drum, yeah, like on top of the snare, really powerful. Um, then, of course, the, the rusty snare, which I don't actually think is really rusty, but it sounds like rusty. That is just like a stretched, distorted, fully saturated... Thing. I don't know if Rusty actually made it or if it's just someone trying to sound like Rusty, but I like the sound of it. So there's that, there's the tambourine, there's the TikTok. And then these little snare fills. Yeah. Um, bit of processing and stuff on the snares. Not much going on, on on those loops, just like a bit of EQ and compression to shape them. And of course, it wouldn't be a song without the young chop snare, would it? So that's actually, that's cool. It's like changing panning, I think. Yeah, if I go here in the clip, you can see I put some panning on automation in the clip. So it's going from left to right. That's really just to add a bit of like ear candy. Let's get to the interesting stuff here, which is this tuned percussion. But before I do so, I'll just have a quick look in the chat. Precarious legal eggshells. Yeah, I don't want to mess with that. <laughs> Cameron says, would you ever do a collab with Pusher? If you have heard of him, would be a dream. I've met Pusher uh, when I played in somewhere in Canada. I played, was it Toronto or I can't remember what city it was, but I played in Canada and um, he played before me. And yeah, he's a really nice guy. Um, I don't really, I'm not familiar with his, that much of his work. Um, I know he's doing stuff with Andrew Huang now on YouTube. 
Um, Andrew Huang's really cool. I like I like his channel a lot. Makes really good stuff. Um, so yeah, I think he's he's like kind of working full time as like Andrew Huang's like mixer and co-producer kind of guy. So that's good for him. Um, do I have anything in the drum group? Asks Frederick Martins. This group with everything. It, like all those layers, it has nothing on it. But the drum, le uh, the drum rack, which has these main drums in it, that has a bit of stuff. So that's got uh, this overdrive, this compressor, analog saturation, bit of EQ, and then another uh, digital saturation. So yeah, that's only affecting these drum layers, which is just like the main kick and snare and hi hat and uh, stuff, but all these other layers are not being affected by the group processing. Um, normally I would be a bit more refined with how I do my drum processing. These drums are quite simple and clean, so I didn't want to overdo it with the black like, saturation and stuff. Um, so that I would normally do similar to what I just showed you, like a bit of compression, a bit of saturation and EQ and stuff. But and I sometimes do like some parallel processing and stuff as well. Um, but in this particular song, I didn't really endeavor too much into that because I wanted to have a very sort of clean, open sound. Um, Riotti, he lives in Toronto. Yeah, I thought so. Um, uh, oh, we got some followers. Phantom Cholo, thank you so much for the follow. And Made by YB, thank you for the follow. Um, yeah, 2015, I remember hearing some stuff he did that I quite liked. Um, that was a pretty busy time for me, so I didn't actually have time to, like, talk to him. I think, I think I did share one of his songs on social media or something. I can't remember. It was a long time ago, guys. Give me a break. <laughs> nah, but good for him. Um. So this tuned percussion here is cool. So the main thing we've got going on here is these tuned 808s. And when I say tuned 808s, I don't mean, like, sub-boomy, like, bass 808s. Let's have a listen. So these are actually, if you look here, down here in the samples, we've got Drum Machine's 808 kick. So this is Ableton's core library kick sample, like 808 kick samples. So these are actual 808 kicks from an 808 machine that they've recorded and included in their core drum library sounds. And what I've done is I've loaded one of these into a sampler and I've played it up really, really high up and I've tuned it so it's in key. Um, so when I play it on a keyboard, like, you can kind of play it, like here, it plays like a tonal blip. Kind of reminds me of that thing that, uh, you know that artist, French artist, one, two, three, MRK? He did that a lot. Like tuning 808, St. John Hawk does it too. Tuning 808 kicks. Because they have this tone to them, and when you play them high up, like normally you'd, they'd be really, really low. And I've obviously cut all the low end out here, so you can't hear that low end, but I'm tuning and using these in a way that so it goes ding dong 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 um, over the drums and I've taken all the low end out and I've boosted the top end with some um, overdrive I've got this delay on here which is just making it stereo which is actually kind of cool because you normally wouldn't hear like an 808 that wide, but it's using the Haas effect, just using a simple delay effect. You can see the left and right time delays are slightly offset. This one's 7.7 .7 milliseconds, this one's 1, one millisecond. So you have them separated in time like that in the left and right channels. They create this cool stereo width. That's called the Haas effect. Um, bit of compression, bit of drive, bit of reverb for some roominess. Blah, 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 more of the same. So yeah, that's, I'm using that as a melodic kind of counterpoint, I suppose. Um, St. John Hawk's so good. Yeah, Cashmere Cat used to do that as well. Yeah, and he actually had a song that has a very similar rhythm to this, which I might have in been inspired by. Dun, dun. Yeah, he did the very similar thing where he went like between the, the fifth and the tonic um, kind of thing. So yeah, that's that. I like that kind of just loops throughout the whole song. It goes down a bit. Syncopated, so it comes in the offbeats. Um, 
yeah, that's cool. And in this group as well, there's nothing actually processing this group. I've just grouped them from my own brain. But we've got these cool, like, synth little whoops. That's fun. So in the similar way that I've tuned the 808 samples and played them high, these are some, like, synth whoops. Like, one of these is jungle sound, and one of them is called synth YB, like... Um... I don't really know. They're probably from like a club sample pack that I got given some time, but they have a tonality to them. Like you can hear, that's been pitched up. This is the original pitch. It like bends up to a to a note and it like ring and it kind of when you pitch it correctly, you can make it in key with the song. And this one is more just like percussive. But if you combine them, you kind of get this cool like so it's kind of like lasers shooting up and down around and you pan them and stuff. Um, I liked doing that. Um, I didn't make those sounds, but I do sort of make similar sounds now that I do similar things with. Kind of ear candy a little bit. Um, Josh Freight, damn those drums knock. Thank you, man. It's always nice to have drums that knock. Let's hear, let's hear him again with that uh, tuned percussion turned on. There's those tuned 808s. Frederick Martins, is gain staging important for a good mix? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I mean, it, depend, it really does depend. And look, all that gain staging is, is how much gain you're sending to whatever your song is, like whatever, so... Gain staging is only important if you're using like buses and groups and then like master effects and all this kind of stuff. So every time you send a piece of audio somewhere, it's getting affected by whatever is on the destination. So for example, if you have a master channel with a bunch of mastering on it, like I have here with, it's just, it's got a compressor and a multiband compressor and then like isotope limiter and all that stuff. Like gain staging is making sure that whatever it hits this chain of effects, it's hitting it at the appropriate gain level. Um, so just making sure that whatever you've got prior to that final stage or whatever group, and you know, if you've got group processing on individual groups, like a drum group or something, making sure that whatever's hitting that bus layer is appropriately gained so that you're not destroying the sound when you hit it, um, like by over compressing it or over distorting it or, or like under saturating or whatever. Gain staging is making sure you hit that sweet spot of gain hitting the processing that you, whatever you're hitting. So of course you can avoid all of that by just not having processing on your groups. And then gain staging, gain staging does not matter at all as long as you're not clipping. Um, that's kind of it. Um, but if you do choose to use group processing, which is useful in a lot of ways, then yes, it is important to know that when you're hitting your group processing, you need to have the appropriate level hitting it. Um, uh, and any saturation you use on an individual layer, I guess, gain staging and taking into account how hard you hit the saturator or how hard you hit the compressor, whatever it might be, those, like the level going into those processes is is what gain staging is all about, to making sure you, um, like for example, some people will just load up a compressor preset or whatever and be like, oh, it sounds good, but then they're not realizing like every time you throw that on a sound, the sound going into that has a different level. So it's going to sound different depending on if you turn the volume of that thing up or down before you hit that effect, if that makes sense. So that's what gain staging is. And if you're doing that kind of process, then yeah, it's definitely important for producing and for mixing. Um, let's keep going. So I've covered the drums, I've covered these tuned percussions. Uh, let's see what we've got next, some effects. Maybe I'll come back to that. I'll come back to the effects and th that stuff later. Let's go into the chords and the bass. So I'll solo that. Nice. Well, actually, let's play it from the verse. Hmm. 
That's cool. So there's a few different layers in the cores. The bass is very simple. Um, Josh Freight asks, am I using the house effect on anything? Everything sounds so big. Yeah, I definitely am. I saw, I just, uh, as before I highlighted that I was using the house effect here on these tuned 808 samples. So you can see this delay. That's doing the house effect with these offset delay times in the left and right channels. And I do do it on other stuff too. That's just one example. Um, it, it's, I try not to overdo the house effect because you can get all kinds of with stereo phasing issues kind of stuff, but it's on certain things it can be really, really effective. Um, so yeah, chords. What do we got? We've got, first up, a beautiful gospel organ. From Contact. This is just basic gospel 2. I think I've probably have, like changed up some of the parameters here. Yeah, you can kind of customize your organ sound here, which is nice. Um, contact, gospel organ. Bit of drive, bit of EQ, sidechain. Under that, we've also got some saw chords from Serum. Oopsie. Um, either way. Yeah, so I think I accidentally did something there to ruin that, but that's okay. There was some, uh, oh, it was probably this, yeah. Who knows? Yeah, so that's just like, you can see there's a square wave there on that side and there's a saw wave on that side, and I had it somewhere in between. <laughs> Serum's so cool with wave tables and stuff. Um, the Serum... Just very simple, like lush, detuned saw chords with a bit of filter filtering. Nothing fancy there at all. This was like early days of Serum, by the way. I had only just probably switched over to Serum from Silence. I was probably using both at this point. Um, and I know that because there's some of the functions in Serum I'm not using here because they didn't exist yet. Like it didn't let you, and like when we get to the solo, I can show you that, but yeah. Um, This is, see, this is silent here. Yeah, so I was still using both at this point because I wasn't really that familiar with Serum yet. Obviously now I'm very familiar with it. Um, Balbs, there is a new free synth called Vital, do you know that? That's so funny that you mentioned that because just before I started streaming today, I was tuned in to... Um, Tennyson for a minute, like just a minute. And he was using Vital. And I was like, what's that? It's like, that looks interesting. That looks cool. What's that? Um, I didn't know it was free though. That's awesome. Um, I will check it out. Free is nice. I love free. Vital. All right. Thank you for the heads up. I'll, I'll download that after this. Um, you could say he's serenading us. Nice. Good one. Uh, favorite silent presets? I don't really use presets. I just initialize and then make sounds from scratch, generally. Um, I don't think there are any presets in this particular song. So... Yeah, just a lush saw pad. Five voices of unison here. Gotta make Serum big, of course. I mean, silent, sorry. Beautiful. Obviously, those chords are quite nice. Oh yeah, there's actually an auto filter here opening up over the course of this passage. And then there's, on top of that, this... Yeah, so... And then there's something else underneath. Oh, another layer, which has like got the deep bass notes. It's nice.
Um, how do I make that smooth pad slash saw thing? Well, just like this. Like, you can kind of see exactly what I've done here in silence. Um, this, I mean, it's different every time, I guess, but it's just saw waves detuned to get that cool chorusy unisy effect. Um, there's no modulation in here. There's not even, the filter in isn't even turned on here. I'm actually just using Ableton's auto filter. Um, and that's it. There's no, there's no fancy tricks there. Um, lots of voices detuned. Um, yes, yeah, so I've got one here for those deep, deep chords. And then this one is high, like I voice the chords higher up. And I've cut out some of the low end to compensate for the fact that there's the deepness underneath. A little bit of reverb, a little bit of auto pan to give it some movement. As long as you have a good, nice filter sound and just a good, like, sort of chorusy, smooth, saw wave, detune, unisy sound, that's really all there is to it. Um, and yeah, EQing it a bit can help if there's like too much, like low mids or something, making it boomy. Source so into an audio filter on the highs with your attack link to the filter going in and out. Yeah, pretty much. Um, do you use Valhalla Vintage Verb? I do. I do. Um, this project will probably not have Valhalla in it because I made this song like five years ago or four years ago or something. So I don't think I had Valhalla then, but I use it now on almost everything. Vintage Verb and Valhalla Room and Valhalla Delay are my three favorite Valhalla plugins. Um, so keep it going. We've got this piano, which is actually from Contact, but I've just flattened it down because I wanted to manipulate the audio. Just like hard hitting, attacky piano. Yeah. Like really compressed as well, because it's sitting underneath these synths um, and the bass. And it's audio because at the end here, that chord. Um, yeah, so got that gospel organ. So there's a bunch of layers kind of interacting. The organ on top. Dun, 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 dun. That's a very cool chord change. Um, yeah. And then we've got some strings here. Same thing, I've flattened out the strings from contact. And it's just that last chord with a bit of trill on it to kind of give it dramatic effect. So with the piano. Cool stuff. Um, what is next? Back to these regular chords. And then in the bridge, there's one more chord patch, which is similar to the gospel organ thing. It's inspired by the fact that I'm using a gospel organ throughout the verses and choruses, but I wanted to have a different organ sound. So I made my own organ sound using Serum right here. Um, it's just like, this is this sort of like customized saw wave shape thing. And then, so it's got some added higher harmonics, just like a regular organ would have. Um, that's really nothing else going on in there. There's no, well, a bit of dimension and chorus. Um, and then, yeah, just sort of. Oh, there's a bit of LFO on the pitch to give it a bit of wobble, pitch wobble. Kind of make it sound like a real organ going through a Leslie speaker. Um, See you later, IRL girl. Thanks for joining. Uh, have a good afternoon, and I'll see you later. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, that's that. And then, obviously, the bass is complementing all of these chords. They're kind of carrying the weight of the low end. So, these are the bass layers right here. The orange ones. Um, we've got a sub bass. 
coming out of Serum. Literally a sine wave. Oh no, it's got a few added, a few harmonics added for thickness. If you watch my last stream, you know that I like to add a little bit of harmonics to my subs to give it some juice. No effects. Little bit of pitch envelope at the start to give it some stab. Um, don't know why I maximized that. There's nothing to really see there. Cutting out the high end, bit of saturation to boost some of those warm harmonics. And then on top, this saw oil bass. This is kind of exactly the same technique I used for bubble wrap if you watch my last stream. Except I'm using Serum now, which has a slightly different sound to it. Um, yeah, so two saw oscillators here, no effects. Filter cutoff automation, or not automation, filter cutoff modulation. You can see that. But then with the sub as well. So that sub's taking care of the low end, obviously. This layer is shaped so there's no low end coming through here, cutting out the highs as well, overdriving the highs, compressing, saturating, compressing again, blah, blah, blah. So that kind of, those combined are kind of the main bass sound. So it's got, it's very simple. It's really just to kind of carry the, the low notes of those chords. Like if I go to the verse, uh, let's play the chords and bass, yeah. So the texture of the bass sound is almost irrelevant here. It just needs, it's just a very simple bass to carry the low, portion of those chords um yeah so i wasn't trying to create crazy bass sounds or anything i was just making a very simple synth bass to let the chords have that deep rumble and like that deep girthiness that you like to have in um beautiful gospel chords so do you make all of your synth sounds in your songs from init or do you use presets ever uh pretty much all init I like the sound design process a lot. I find it quite inspiring. So I generally do that. Um, will you show us how to make a sub with the added distortion you were talking about? Yeah, I can show you how to do that. Um, I'm not gonna do it in this stream, but I will show you, like I'm gonna do it more streams where I do like more in-depth sound design stuff. Um, but I can show you now, just right now in this, this is generally my approach. Um, so, if you get any old synthesizer, initialize it. I just happen to use Serum here. Um, Serum's cool. It lets you add, it lets you do what they call additive synthesis, which is basically adding um, harmonics on top of a, saw, a sine wave. So you open up the little wave editor here, and you can see that's the wave I've got here. If I open it up, I can see here all I've done is I've got this fundamental here. So that's the sine wave, that first fundamental. And then each of these little additional poles on top those are the harmonics. So you can add as many as you like. Um, the more you add, the more textured your waveform becomes. So if you add all of them, you get a saw wave, which is the most sort of sizzly waveform. If you add all of them, but only every second one, you remove every second one, you only have the odd numbers, that's a square wave. And there's lots of different formulas for how you can create waveforms. But if you're doing it custom and you just want a basic saw, a basic sub, um, Obviously, you want a very smooth sounding waveform, so I start with the sine wave and then add a little bit of stuff to suggest the idea of moving towards like a triangle wave or something like that to give it a bit of upper harmonics. The bottom here is kind of irrelevant. That's just shaving, changing the phase of the, of the harmonics so you can change where they sit. Um, I don't want to go in too in depth right now because then I'm going to... Um... Oh, Cosmos Midnight is in the chat. Thanks, guys, for joining. Everyone say hi and congratulate them on their potentially number one billboard song with BTS. <laughs> um, thanks for joining, guys. Um, yeah, Subway, subs. Uh, uh, look, I'm going to do another, like, proper stream where I go over how I design sounds. Actually, you know what? Screw it. I'll just show you right now. I'll just duplicate this so I don't ruin it. Um, here. Let's go back to here. Look, I can add... Harmonics, yeah? Like, look, I just, ma I just made that by just adding these harmonics. You can just draw them in. That's why Serum's so cool. Let's see how that sounds. E epic. <laughs> um, so, yeah. 
And if I clear all that out, you can kind of hear. The more you add, the more textured the waveform becomes. But in this instance, um, all I did was create a very basic sub bass. Hopefully that answered your question, but I'm going to do more in this in the future where I get into the more technical nerdy stuff. But yeah, to answer your question, I do create most of my sounds from scratch. Um, yes, everyone send them love. Yesteryear's favorite album ever. You guys killed it. They did kill it, didn't they? Bloody Legends. That did answer my question. Thank you. I'm glad to answer your question, Josh. Keep them coming if you got more. Um, so that's kind of the bass. The only other bass sound in this song is this like deep saw bass here. Let's see. And that's just in the bridge. Just kind of in that in that cool chord change. Oh, let me play that. I love that part. So it kind of rolls up like it filters up and also the pitch bend is moving up so it kind of comes out of nothing like it's rising from the ground or something it's cool um yeah and then you've got this fake organ thing that i made on top uh does the phasing you have on the sub have to relate to how it sits at the kick no not at all um the phasing is to do with the actual like it kind of changes the tone of the wave a little bit. Um, like it, the phase of the harmonics will interact with the phase of the other harmonics in the same wave. So it's not really to do with the kick or any other sound in the song. It's just like um, if you have a lot of harmonics going on in a sound, the phase of one of them might affect the tone of another one because you get phase relationships within the waveform itself. Um, it's honestly, it doesn't make a huge difference. I just like kind of play with it until I get it in a way that sounds or looks good. <laughs> the way the waveform looks is very important. <laughs> if it looks ugly, it's going to sound bad. No, nah, just kidding. Um, so that kind of covers the chords. Um, and then we've got some ops. Pretty nice. So, yeah, I kind of covered how I made this song in the bubble wrap stream. Uh, made this sound in the bubble wrap stream. Uh, very similar thing. I'll open up silent, make it big, of course. There it is. Oops, I just realized I can go full screen. Let's do that. Better late than never. Um, yeah, so I do this trick where I have like ops. I basically make like a very short blip. If I turn this off and I activate the freaking sound. There it is. Every time I hit a note, it's just a very short blip, no matter how long I hold the note. Very short, like, kind of hit of sound. And what we've got here is we've got two oscillators in silent. One of them is a sine wave, one of them is a square wave. The square wave is mixed quite low. As you can see, the volume's turned quite far down, and the, saw, the sine wave is all the way up. Um, each of them has a different amount of voices, but that's just to give it, like, a unisony texture. More detune up here to give it a bit more, like, chorusiness in the square wave. But the real trick here, and as I covered in the last stream, is that this square wave here is actually pitched three octaves higher than the fundamental of the regular oscillator. So let's, let's listen to what happens if I change that. that. If I have them both at the same octave, it sounds like this. Which is cool. But it sounds so nice and sparkly, it adds this kind of... It's almost as if you're creating like a metallic or glassy sound by having this distance between the two layers. It creates this kind of crystally pure sound. Um, it's hard to describe without kind of getting into like psychoacoustic theory, but 
that's a cool trick if you ever want to create like a crystally crystally kind of bell sound um, that's how I do it well it's how it's one of the ways you can do it you can also do it with FM which is way more in like detailed and in-depth which is also really really cool and fun but before I was nerdy enough to understand how FM worked I um, did this um, after watching your streams a lot, you really use the arpeggiator from Ableton to your advantage with the steps. Oh, definitely. I love the arpeggiator in, in Ableton. It's the best. And you can see the sound itself in this thing is very, very simple. It's just two things, two oscillators playing a very short blip, um, one tuned higher, and then the arpeggiator and the chord voicings with the MIDI giving it all that character and movement. So just playing 16th notes um, with two steps to kind of shift between different octaves as the chords play. A little bit of reverb. And that's kind of it, a little bit of auto pan. The only other arp we have is this one arp splash, which is essentially the same sound. But let's have a look. Yeah, it's actually the same sound. So it's the same patch, but I've changed the parameters in the like arpeggiator and probably the processing. So it's much faster in this one. So it sweeps through the whole chord really quickly. And then um, it's also got these delays on it to let it tail off. So if I turn them off, just one like chord that it plays, but the delay lets it tail as if it's like, reverberating out into the mountainous landscape. <laughs> um, so those are the ARPs. Nothing too complicated in this one for the ARPs. And it's just following the main chord progression. Now, my favorite part of this song and Probably the last element I'll cover here is this synth solo. Let's just play it. Let's just play it and enjoy it. That's my favorite part of the song. Um, it's like, I love putting like melodic solos in songs. It's just so obnoxiously fun. Uh, <laughs> hell yeah. Did you go over the vocal chop and the processing of the vocal chop already? I must've missed it. No, um, I did cover the vocal, but I'll show you. There's actually no processing on there at all. It's just a um, this vocal chop here. I'm assuming this is what you're talking about. That's actually from the stems. The Snake Hips boys made this sound in their own song. Well, their original version of the song. Like that sound. And all I did was take it out of the stems and use it as a sample and chopped up little snippets of it. Just a tiny bit of EQ to clean it up. That's all it is. Like I said at the start of the stream, it really helps when the source material you have is so good. And the Snake Hips guys did really great production here. And I, yeah, I loved that little snippet of vocal ambience. So I just used it and chopped it up. And yeah, obviously chopping it up on the grid to give it that syncopated, like choppy set. It was already in the stems, but if you wanted to do something like that yourself, create a sound like this. So I'm hearing a pitched up vocal. I'm hearing a lot of, I'm hearing like a melodic phrase being sung. It's being pitched up a lot. It's been, processed with a bunch of compression, reverb, delay, and EQ. And then it's bounced, it's just bounced out as a stem here. That kind of texture tails off. That's all it is. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a really cool sound. Fresh Hex asks, yo baby, did they send you wet stems only for the vocals? That's a good question. I'm gonna check that for you right now. Snake hips. Wait, no. What am I doing? Uh, I'm pretty sure they sent me all the stems. Oh yeah, remix stems. Here it is. What do we got? 
Oh, no, that's a different song. All my friends. Yeah, we've got a stems for the whole song, and then we've got stems vocals. Oh, no, yeah, so it sounds like they did send all the vocals with their production on it. So I guess they didn't want... They didn't send me the drives because I was... Because I'm doing a remix, I, was, I wasn't, like, mixing the song, so I, they wanted to keep all their production effects and stuff in there. So they just sent me the um, the wet vocal stems from their project. Um, yeah. What is the chance chop at bar 71? Wow, we've got a bar reference number. Good stuff. Here we go. Oh, that's this. So I think that's just part of Chance's um, a cappella. Yeah, you can see this is the fight. This is Chance the rapper's verse and his like ad libs. Um, and I just took a little bit of one of his ad libs or his backing vocals and because he sung it and it was like in tune with the song, so I chopped it up and used it as like a vocal chop. Uh, Ryan Hemsworth remix Deconstructed would be crazy. Jacques Rowe. I agree, and I am planning on doing that one. Um, I love that one. Um, I'm, I wasn't sure if people, like, if it was, like, a popular enough one to get into, but if uh, if people ask for it, and um, I would love to do that one. It's one of my favorites. Uh, if you pitch that up, it would be in crazy frog territory. <laughs> yeah. My Dick Army. Nice username, and thank you. Um, uh, let's go to the synth solo section. So this is cool. I quite like what I did here. So we've got solo here. So the synth solo is, is just um, a serum patch here. Let's play it isolated. So two saw oscillators with unison. Um, got the pitch bend set to plus twelve and minus twelve, which means I can get a long pitch bend range for some of those articulations. Got a bit of flanger, bit of compressor, bit of EQ, and a bit of hyperdimension. That's the main core of the sound. Here we've got the modulation matrix. So what this is, I've got the mod wheel, right? This thing here. You can see the mod wheel moving as the solo plays. You see that how it goes up as the as the some of the notes like it's automated in and what's happening when the mod when, when the mod wheel goes up the LFO for both oscillators pitch is um, being triggered so the LFO is mapped to the pitch of LFO, of oscillator one and two this LFO here is just a simple triangle LFO and as the mod wheel goes up that LFO is implemented into the sound so What's that? What is that doing? It's just creating a very simple vibrato. Um, and nowadays, Serum actually has this function where you can just go here and go create vibrato <laughs> um, from unused LFO via pitch wheel, which is exactly what I do now. But they didn't have this function when I first started using Serum, so I did it myself. Um, so yeah, that's why I can where you can see I've like mapped it to the coarse pitch and stuff. So yeah, it's just a mod wheel um, vibrato, which is really fun. And then that is very that makes the solo way more expressive because when you get vibrato automated and it's like it's kind of like if you're playing guitar and you can like bend the note or like do vibrato on it it's really way more expressive so i programmed in all the mod wheel and all the pitch wheel information in the in the clips here you can see there's like pitch bend information and then there's mod wheel information you can see the mod wheel going up um so yeah bit of EQ and delay and reverb and stuff on the actual sound but then it's layered again with this thing and this is the same MIDI I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same MIDI um, on this sound I would have copy pasted it probably so this is a sample called Oberbrass um, I think this is called Oberbrass because it's a brass a synth brass patch from an Oberheim synthesizer um, that's been recorded out um, and it's really cool like Let's play it. 
So someone with an old school like Ober, Oberheim synth, which are like classic synths, um, has created this brass sound and like sampled it out. So I've got this one note from this Ober brass patch thing and I used that to double the solo MIDI. And it's got all the same like pitch bend and stuff information. You can see it's all in there. And I've put that into the um, the settings of this sample here. So you can see I've got LFO1 amount pitch doing like mod wheel and then you can see the mod wheel and the pitch bend lighting up as it plays. So it's like doubled up. So it's kind of like I'm playing two keyboards at once with the exact same solo, <laughs> um, which is why it sounds like really sizzly and cuts through. And then at the end of the solo, for that little embellishment, dun, 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 that it doubled with this glockenspiel from Contact. So that gives it a little extra sparkle. And it's exactly what I did in Bubble Wrap. Um, we've got glockenspiel layered with a marimba and a celesta from Contact. Very chimey, sparkly. Um, love your music. Awesome to see you create it live on Twitch. Thank you. Um, thank you for tuning in. This is more like a breakdown. So I'm not actually making the song today. I'm just going over the, the song that I made in the past. But I am going to probably do a bit more of that. Making it live. Perhaps. Maybe. We'll see how that goes. Um, how do you pitch bend with sampler? Oh, you can just go into the sampler and... Um, like you can, it responds to MIDI, MIDI information. So if you send it pitch information with a pitch wheel or whatever, you can set the um, pitch bend range here in the MIDI tab and it, um, it responds just like a regular, a regular keyboard would. It's, um, it's a really cool instrument. Um, sex official, the man is back in town, creative use of the sampler. Oh, thank you. And thanks for tuning in. Chimes plus synth are amazing. Thank you. Um, do I ever use session view? Not really. Um, it's not really helpful for producing a song. Arrangement view is my go-to for production. I might use session view if I'm not doing production stuff. But um, yeah, arrangement view for all my productions, for sure. Um, yeah. Um, so that's the solo. I'm quite proud of that. And when I played it live at Falls, I actually played it live on my Moog over there. Let me show it to you. I've got a sub-37 over there. Um, so I like to try and play that live. I kind of recreated the patch and like tried to play it live. Um, I'm not that good at keyboard, though, so... <laughs> um, I just realized you probably couldn't see that very well. I'm only in the corner, very small. Sorry. Uh, bridge is next. Bridge part is really the only part where like a different chord progression comes in. It's a classic bridge move. Mm, gets a bit more, uh, what's the word? Sentimental? Sad? <laughs> mm. So I kept going with the gospel vibe, um, but wanted it to be a bit more like gloomy because the lyrics here are quite like, the vocals here are quite sad from Tanashi. Me. So if I get lonely, so she's talking about loneliness, she's talking about being feeling lonely. Overhead, I'm stuck here with the vultures hissing and circling. She sounds isolated, she feels trapped. I was like, well, let's make it feel sad and lonely with the chords. So that's what I tried to do. Um, and then it kind of just very briefly kind of ends on this ominous tone. Vultures hissing and circling. Oh yeah, the, the bass slide here is my one of my favorite parts. I love how it slides in. It's kind of like someone like getting like a five string bass and like on the low B note or something. It's like super sexy. Yeah. 
and all the chords and bass drop away here for this little build up thing. Into the final chorus. So I deliberately got rid of the bass and chords there because I wanted a bit of a gap between the sad lonely part and the happy chorus part. Um, it didn't really work if I just went straight into it, so I had to have a bit of a break there. Um, and it's filled with a lot of effects. I haven't covered this effects group yet, so I'll cover that now. Um, it's not particularly interesting, it's just like effects, but I'll show you what I got nonetheless. Um, we're here for you, Tanashi. We certainly are. We love Tanashi. So of course I have to do my obligatory freesound.org shout out because we've got Sandy Abbey's Glissando Downsweep. Air horn for uh, freesound.org, please. Thank you. Um, so I use this all the time. It's, all, it's actually littered throughout the song. How cool is that sound? Thank you, Divorce Papers. Shout out freesound.org. Um, then we've got, again, my classic go-to wind chimes, Ableton, Latin percussion. I pretty much use that in every song I've ever made. Uh, white noise sweep that I made in operator. This, this should all be familiar stuff to you guys if you've been watching these streams. Um, I mean, I do make them from scratch every time because I like to have a little bit of fine tuning with how I do it, but um, it's the same process and the very similar sound every time. Sandy RB saves the day. He always saves the day. Um, he saved the day many a time in my productions. That's a cool, like, wobbly sign riser. So you can see here, I've done the same thing I did with the sub. I've added some harmonics in the operator panel here um, to give it, like, a bit of a juicy sine wave thing. And then the LFO on the pitch moving really fast. And the, and the pitch of the sine wave is just being pitch bended up in the clip you can see here. Let's see. Pitch bend. Nope. Here it is. MIDI control. Yeah, pitch bend just going all the way up. Um, and then that LFO on the pitch is making it wobble. Good stuff. Same thing, but with a square wave. Um, this is cool, like a reverberated kick drum impact. Very epic. <laughs> Freesound.org, lend me your strength. Freesound. A moment of appreciation for Freesound.org, please. Thank you so much. Um, what's my favorite drum sample packs? I don't use, um, I, as I explained, I don't use that many sample packs. I, I love drum machine sample packs because I don't own drum machines like that many. I love like my favorite drum machine sound is probably the 707. Um, I obviously love the 808s and the 909s. I kind of just use them and manipulate them to my will as much as I can. I don't, if you're asking like if I go to like specific curated sample packs designed for like EDM or or particular genres or whatever. I don't. I don't really use them. I make my own sounds for my own style and my own music, based in just like core rudimentary sounds from like classic machines and classic instruments. So yeah, I'll, I'll be using a lot of 808s and 909s, and then layering that with other things and creating the textures myself and just building it up, doing my own sound design. Um, that's what I find is the most uh, effective and productive way for me to create sounds. So yeah, this is a, well, this is a sample. I mean, I use samples, obviously. This is from probably an old, I think it's an old Yamaha drum machine. I've got a folder on my computer just called like drum machines. And it's just a, a huge collection basically of like classic 70s and 80s and 90s drum machines that someone's just collected all the samples from and just put them in a big folder. Um, and I, I go through that sometimes and just find one that I like. Um, and a lot of the time I'll just use kick to create it myself as well. So this is, yeah, got a huge amount of reverb on it with filter, just getting all that lows and just having that reverberate out for a long time and see that low energy there kind of with the chimes and the high end stuff on top kind of creates this impactful wall of sound. Me. 
And there's a few other little bits and bobs here. Wow, we got Spire. Who remembers Spire? Um, I don't really use this ever, but I must have used it here. Spire is really only, I think, useful for me if I'm going through the presets. I find the sound design layout really tricky to work with. I don't find it particularly comfortable to work with. But there are some good sounds in here if you're into that. Um, I think I made this somehow, but it was like a struggle. So it's kind of just a woo. Yeah, there it is. Woo. Um, just like a very sizzly sort of pitch down effect. Um, we've got a skirt. Where's the skirt? Is that even in here ever? Oh no, it's here. Okay. What's this? Oh yeah, I use this in bubble wrap as well. There's so many similarities between this and bubble wrap. I probably made them at a similar time. It's a little bit of like a car scratch sound, which I think correlates with what we hear in the lyrics. We reinvent the wheel just to fall asleep at it. We reinvent the wheel just to fall asleep at it. Skirt. Okay. Very clever. Um, pops. Again, same pops I used in my bubble wrap production. Um, I think it's actually, yeah, it's pretty much the same sounds. Same samples, like my own pop from my mouth here. And then there's... Oh, these little eye drop sounds. I think they're from a video game. But they sound like little pops. So I went pop, 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 like this. Pretty cool. Um, bit of bit of uh, processing on that just to make them feel brighter, I think. Yeah, so... Spire is useful for PC music. Yeah, there's some definitely some PC music presets in there. <laughs> for sure. Um, what are you using saturation to do? Saturation adds harmonics and adds um, like very subtle distortion to sounds, which can help um, bring out a certain color or flavor from a sound if, it, if you want. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's also very good. It's also a, a specific type of compression. If you want to compress a sound, but you don't want to use a very clean sounding traditional compressor, you can use a saturator to sort of subtly embellish and clip some of the harmonics. Um, uh, it was a really good saturator from Sound Toys called Decapitator, which I use now. I didn't have it at this time when I made this, but I use that on everything now. Really good on, pardon me, really good on drums, really good on bass, a lot of stuff. Um, so yes, that, that saturation is good for adding like sort of characteristic warmth and harmonic richness to sounds and also as a way of compressing and clipping sounds if you need. Um, yeah, just kind of makes things sound good sometimes. Sometimes it makes it sound bad. So just got to try it out. There's lots of different types of saturation too. Even the Ableton saturator has um, different modes. So you can see there's analog, soft sign, medium curve, hard curve, sinoid fold, digital clip, and wave shaper. And all of those have different sounds and different parameters. Um, the analog one is just a very simple, like based on like an analog tube saturator or something like that. And it sounds nice. So yeah. How to use and when to use compressor for you. That's really the hardest part to learn. Oh, uh, yeah. Compression does take a while to learn, to be honest. Um, there is no real hard and fast rules for that. Um, it's kind of like you got to compress if you need to compress. Like a lot of, if you, if you're using a lot of samples in your, in your music, then it, samples tend to already be compressed. Um, you can tell if you look at the waveform and you can see there's a big dynamic in the amplitude. You can see if there's like really tall parts of the waveform and really short parts of the waveform, then you know that that's a dynamic sound, which means it's not very compressed. But then if you look at a waveform and the, and the waveform is very even throughout, that means it's already very compressed or it's not a very dynamic sound. So then you know you probably don't need compression or compression won't really do much for you in that situation. Um, so obviously things like drums that have very sharp hits and have very sharp peaks, compression can be really useful. Like, so obviously things like snare drums, clap, so clap sounds, like, um, or any sound really that has like a sharp attack. Um, compression is your friend there. Um, and, it, and there's lots of different ways you can, obviously using compressor on vocal because vocals are very, very dynamic sounds, but then it's a whole, it's a whole different ball game compressing a vocal because you have to know what kind of compression, whether you want the release to be slow, whether you want the fast or slow attack. Like the attack and release settings can make a huge difference because if you have slow attack settings, then you're going to let a lot more 
energy through at the start of those peaks. And if you have very fast attack settings, you can let it'll catch all the peaks, but it won't. It can often make your sound very flat and lose a lot of excitement and energy. Um, so there's, it's obviously possible to overcompress and compress wrong using, um, you know, incorrect attack and release settings or overcompressing with a way too low threshold or high ratio or whatever. Um, you kind of just have to understand what every element of a compressor does. So there's a, every compressor has a threshold, a ratio, an attack, and a release. Usually there's some other settings too, but those are the main ones. And you need to understand what each of those things does um, before you sort of assume that you know what you're going to do if you put it on a sound. And analog compressors, if you're using compressors that are based on analog stuff, they have this inbuilt character and saturation as well. Um, whereas modern compressors like digital compressors and the stuff in Ableton is very digital and clinical, so it's much more like clean sounding. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a rabbit hole, man. Compression, I'm still learning, to be honest. Um, it's one of the most useful but probably most incorrectly understood or used things for producers who are just starting out, I guess. I know that I used it incorrectly for a very long time. Um, if you use the digital clip on the Ableton Saturator and drive it hard, you can get some extra headroom. That's true, because when you use the digital clip, that's a hard clipper, which means it doesn't let anything through. Um, so, yeah, if you clip using the digital clipper, it's going to clip off all those peaks. Um, anything, that's, anything that hits the saturator will just disappear, which is why it usually sounds very harsh and very, very digitally distorted. Um, but if you use it subtly and you use it, cleverly and only on small bits of audio or like small peaks you can really get a lot of headroom like if you have a hi-hat or something that um has a really short and sharp attack you can run that through a digital clipper sometimes and like get that peak will just disappear but you'll still get the quality of the hi-hat especially if it's blended in in the mix same thing with snare drums and stuff like that yeah digital clipping a, a really like professional one is called k-clip which does it very very smoothly and very transparently I use that. It's called K K Clip by Kazrog, and um, yeah. But the Ableton one in digital clip mode is pretty good too. Uh, sometimes it sounds like shit, but you can get some juice on drum groups this way. That's very true. Um, and if you want it really, really clean and not affecting the sound too much, like the color of the sound, then yeah, digital clip is the way to go. But if you want a bit of warmth or a bit of harmonic distortion, then maybe you want to use like the analog modes instead. Um, really depends what you're going for. Um, but last and not least, last but not least, sorry, we have these chants, um, which are like little vocal chants. <laughs> cool. Good stuff. Literally all of these are probably from a Lex Luger trap sample. So we've got like Watts and Hayes and stuff. This is kind of one of my signatures. I use these haze pitched up. So like the original pitch is this. Hey, like really low. But then I pitch it up a lot so it sounds like children. And I'm using the harsh effect here as well. Someone asked before, you've got the different delay times in each channel on the left and right. So it sounds stereo separated. That's the original. That's with the stereo juice. Um, is a transient shaper just a compressor? No. A transient shaper is the opposite of a compressor. It's an expander. So what it does is when it detects audio... So what a compressor... Let me, let me just give you a short lesson. <laughs> um, could you do the same thing in a compressor as a transient shaper? Well, you need a compressor that can work in reverse and become an expander. So what a, a compressor, when it detects audio that goes above a certain threshold, the compressor brings the volume of that audio down very quickly. So imagine you have a piece of audio coming in, it's nice and quiet, nice and quiet, and then a big loud spike. And then the compressor, when that spike happens, it's catching the spike and it's bringing it down to the level of the quiet stuff, right? Based on your settings. That's essentially very roughly what a compressor does. An expander, on the other hand, when it detects that spike, it's going to actually make the spike louder. So it's expanding the dynamic rather than compressing the dynamic if that makes sense. So what a transient shaper does is it's an expander. So when it hears those peaks, it hears those big spikes, it actually makes them louder to emphasize the transient. So that's actually a compressor in reverse. Um, 
So to answer your question, no, you can't necessarily, if a compressor doesn't have an expansion mode, then you can't use it in the same way a transient shaper would. But that being said, Ableton, like Cameron just pointed out, the Ableton compressor does have an expander mode, which means you can use it in that way. But an expander and a compressor are essentially polar opposites. But they do work with the same parameters. Um, they just work. One makes things quieter, one makes things louder. Um, Balb says dynamic more or less is better for an entire song. That is generally true. I mean, it's about balance. You've got to have some sort of dynamic, otherwise it's just going to be exhausting to listen to. But compression can be really, really fun and creative and cool and can make sounds and songs really, really epic. <laughs> if you know how to use it. it. Takes a while to figure out how to use it properly. It took me a long time. Moving on, we got another similar thing here. So this is a what, but it's pitched up. Yeah! I think that's Juicy J saying, yeah! yeah. Um, yep. 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 So all of these are just like little snippets of, of audio chants just kind of used to embellish this final chorus, basically. Or well, the last two choruses, actually. Whoa, so the, yeah, these are just, it kind of speaks for itself. Let's play it with the drums and the bass. So yeah, I was really just using it as a kind of ear candy um, to make it sound a bit more hype, I suppose. Um, and the last thing, as someone mentioned at the start of the stream, there's this layer called Alex Hey, because I have a friend called Alex, and she said, hey. Hey! Pitched it up. Cool little background vocal texture. Hey! hey. And with that... We have every sound in the song. That is all the layers. We do have a reverb send here, which I'm just sending some of the vocals to, even though there was probably already reverb on there. Yeah, I just added a little, little bit more reverb to help it sit within my mix. It's very subtle. We reinvent the wheel just to fall asleep at it. Yeah, giving a little bit more space and dimension. Um, and then on the master, we just have a little tiny bit of compression, a little tiny bit of multiband compression. Crash on the floor. Let's see how much it's doing. Not much. Crash on the floor, catch the ZZZ. Little tiny bit of gain reduction. Crash on the floor, catch the ZZZ. Popping the polar opposite the end. Very small amounts of gain reduction on each band here. Crash on and then trusty old isotope. At the time, I only had ozone, f ozone 5. <laughs> Obviously, I use ozone 8 now, but. Um, here we have just a bit of equalization to boost where the drums are hitting and where the vocals are sitting and cutting out the low. Harmonic Exciter, which is really cool, lets you sort of... I'm using it in multi-band mode and mid-side mode, so you can actually saturate the different bands slightly differently to give a bit of like harmonic excitement in certain parts of the frequency range. And you can do that for the mids and for the sides separately. As you can see there, I got the mids here, the sides here, and it's divided into the four bands. Super completely unnecessary. It's very subtle. And I probably spent way too long doing that. Stereo imaging. That's just a basically a stereo enhancement by a kind of I'm reducing a bit of the stereo in the bass area and then uh, very subtly enhancing the stereo image on the on the top bands. And then just a big old limiter. And that's it, guys. That's the song. Um... Got some questions. Ball and Beats Auto says, is the bass in Serum? Sorry, I missed the beginning. Yes, it is. Uh, there are two bass layers. I'll show you very quickly. Um, basses are here. We've got a sub bass, which is from Serum. Yep. And we've got a saw bass, which is also from Serum. So yes. And then there's a very similar duplicate bass sound for the bridge. All of them are Serum. 
Um, did you mix this project more in another project? No, uh, in this for this one, I did all the mixing in this project. Um, nowadays, I do do my mixes in another project. I probably export um, the stems out and then do a proper mix in another project with the like fresh set of ears and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, in this case, I just did it all in this project right here. Um, does compressor on the master for the feeling or the glue of the compressor sound, or is it for tr taming peaks? Oh, it's for both. So generally, you add a compressor on the master just because when all those sounds get combined and come out one channel, there's going to be layers interfering with each other and stuff combining and just creating peaks. So a little tiny bit of compression just to bring everything back into a neat package at the very end. And you have to be subtle with it because everything before this is already compressed anyway. So yeah, taming a little bit of those peaks that might come to just from combining all those sounds together. And you can get a little bit of, um, like you want to set your release and attack setting so that you're not making it feel too like snappy or fast. So you have, you do get, you want to tune it, I guess, so that the feeling is there, so that the release setting is kind of pulsing at a musical um, rate, depending, because a release can be a lot to do with your, the tempo of your song. So if you've got a really fast song, you want the release probably to be faster as well so that the, the tails of that release when the compression hits are coming up in time with the song. Whereas if you have a slower song, you want that, you want to tune that release time so it doesn't feel like the release is happening at an offbeat time. It's, very, it's a hard thing to describe, very subtle, but um, release times and attack times can be tuned musically. Um, yeah, so that's kind of to answer that. So that kind of covers the project. If there's anything else you guys wanted to know, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to switch back over to my... Uh, why use a multiband compressor on the master? Same reason as before. Um, I like being able to divide the different frequency bands. So being able to compress just the bass and just the mids and just the highs, it allows me to divide the whole song into three distinct parts. Like the vocals obviously sit at the high end and the bass and the kick drum sit in the low end and being able to, after everything is said and done, being able to divide those elements up and control each one a little bit more um, by compressing and leveling it separately. Cause you can see I've got output here controlling the level of each of those bands. So it just gives me a little bit of final master slash mix control. I mean, if I was getting the song professionally mastered, I wouldn't do this, but because I mastered this myself, that's was my way of doing that. Um, why do you like to divide them and compress them separately? Well, because it's important to consider each element of your song as its own distinct uh, part. So being able to know that I have a bass at like the low end of my song, which is, compiled, which is comprised of the bass and the kick elements and all that stuff, and knowing that that needs to be treated a certain way so that the other parts of the song uh, have room and all that kind of stuff. This is a, just a last final way to sort of control that. Okay, let's see if I turn it. It's not a huge difference. It's quite subtle, but. It helps to glue everything together because when I, like, if, if I just put a whole, a big compressor on the whole thing, like I obviously did that very subtly here, but the advantage of multiband means that if I, if I put a, just a one compressor on there controlling everything, it means that when the kick hits, it's going to compress the whole song, but I don't want the whole song to be compressed. I only want the kick to be compressed. So that's the advantage of multiband. It lets you compress where you want to compress and keep everything else kind of intact. So being able to let the vocals sit on top and have independent level control just for the vocal elements and then the same thing for the bass elements and the mid elements. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, like I said, if I was getting this professionally mixed and mastered, I wouldn't have done that, but I did this all myself. And I've generally avoid using multiband on the master now anyway, but yeah, so that's it guys. Uh, multiband compression changed my life. Thanks, Wave Racer. <laughs> You're welcome, Fresh Hex. It's a life-changing, it's a life-changing thing. Uh, I'm glad I answered your question, Josh Freight. Thank you for asking, and thank you for tuning in. Um, that pretty much covers it for today. Uh, I need to pee, and I need to eat lunch, and I need to get out of this hot and sweaty room. 
Uh, XOXO, thank happy Thanksgiving from San Francisco. Thanks for the streams and excited to join the Discord and create a positive community. Yes, um, you can join the Discord. Let's see, have I got my chat up still? No, I don't. Let me see if I'll just quickly open the chat and I can link to the Discord in the chat. Um, I don't, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving here in Australia, but thank you anyway. Um, oops. We, um, but thank you anyway, and... Uh, but when will you stream anyway, next time? And... Ah! I don't want to hear myself. Sorry. Um, I can go like this. I can go Discord. There it is. I can also go YouTube. There it is. You can follow me on both those places and wherever else you want to. Um, it's dinner time in LA. It's lunchtime here. When will I stream next? Ask Balbs2272. Um, I'm doing this every two weeks. So two weeks from today, same time. Uh... But I also may do some little, uh, some little cheeky streams in between then and now as well, um, if I feel like it. <laughs> I'll see you next stream. Yes. Thank you. Satin Spiller. Yo. Oh my God. The three hour meeting is over and you missed the entire stream. Damn. That's a shame. But hey, you can watch it back. It's going to be up here for you to watch back in its entirety. So don't fret, my dude. Enjoy your coffee, my dude. Thank you very much. I will. Thank you, Carlson. Thank you for tuning in. Um... Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, as always. If you have any final questions before I wrap this up, if you have any final thoughts, final things you'd like to say to pass on to me before I... Uh, you prefer the YouTube edits? Yes. <laughs> Look, so do I. This is me creating the content so that I can have something to edit with. <laughs> uh, yeah, the YouTube edits are much more concise and much more fun. Panama Remix next, you reckon? Okay. Well, I might do another remix next. I'm thinking... Tossing up between maybe Ryan Hemsworth, maybe Panama, maybe uh, Duke Dumont. Um, what is that one what sample that everyone in Future Base uses like, that's like high pitched? It's probably one of the Lex Luger ones. Um, I don't know. I can't speak for other people, but it's probably one of those. Uh, they're hilarious. So you think you like the YouTube edits? edits thank you. Yusuke, you like it raw. Okay. Hey, well, each to their own. Um, uh, hey, as always, follow me on Twitter. Follow me on wherever else you want to. SoundCloud, you know. Um, it's all happening. I'll link the Discord once again in case you missed it. Uh, you can follow me there. I'm going to try and build a community there. I'm going to try and make this a more interactive and enjoyable experience for everyone. Um, hopefully you guys are liking the streams. I don't know. Please, uh, in the Discord, there's actually a, a little suggestions channel for the Discord itself and for my Twitch channel. So if you have any thoughts, any uh, inspirations, any suggestions that you'd like to pass on to me, please do so um, in the Discord over there. We'll make that happen. And with that, I'm going to end today's stream. Um, let's see. Should we raid someone? Who is raidable right now? <laughs> 